Grace and peace to you all in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And I welcome you, th welcome you this morning as we gather for the first time since the winter for a gathered worship service as a congregation. Some of you are, are in, in uh, attendance this morning at our worship service, while some of you are at home uh, or on vacation or are away. We are the one body of Christ. Those of us who are gathered here worship alongside those of you who may be worshiping as you watch this video for this particular Sunday. As we begin our service this morning, uh, we, we uh, encourage those who are in attendance to, again, keep masks on when it comes to music, hum along, or just listen reflectively to the songs that have been selected for our worship services as well. Please remember that it's important for us to maintain safe distances from one another, six feet apart, if possible, um, with regard to our interactions with one another. After our service is over, if you would like to spend some time in fellowship with one another, we have set some chairs up in the memorial garden. You are invited to go out and to find a spot where you might sit or stand and, and have fellowship with one another. Uh, in a safe and open space for this particular time. We will be gathering uh, beginning today for worship services in our sanctuary, and we will be celebrating the Sacrament of Communion this, uh, for the month of August on the second Sunday of the month, August the 9th. We have we've placed an order for communion elements to be uh, served in a unique way, and we're awaiting the arrival of that shipment. It has not, it has not come yet, so we're, we're pushing our celebration of communion back one week in order to make sure that we have received those elements. Also, I would remind you that on Thursday, August 13th, there is an ice cream social that will be taking place here. It will be between 6 and 8 p.m. There will be music provided. There will be ice cream. There will be an opportunity for you and for those in the community to, to join with us for a time of fellowship alongside one another. So I would encourage you to mark your calendars and plan to join us for that special event on August the 13th. Those are the significant pieces in the life and in the work of our congregation at this time. Other things will be provided or, or information about other activities will be provided to folks as we, as we move forward into the, the coming month as well. I invite you this morning to join with me in our call to worship. Blessed be God, whose word gives hope and shapes our dreams, whose love has conquered death. Blessed be God, who orders our way and guides our steps, who leads us into life. I invite you to listen to our opening song this morning, Take Thou Our Minds, Dear Lord.
If God is for us, who can be against us? Let us, on this day, confess our sins to the one who searches us and knows us. I invite you to join with me in our prayer of confession. Let us pray together. We confess that we have turned away from you and have not lived with upright hearts. Forgive us for failing to follow you. Guide our feet to walk in your ways and serve your world to the glory of your name. Amen. I invite you to hear the words from the psalmist as we remember God's graciousness and we, we acknowledge God's presence for us. Your decrees are wonderful, therefore my soul keeps them. The unfolding of your words gives light, it imparts understanding to the simple. With open mouth I pant, because I long for your commandments. Turn to me and be gracious to me, as is your custom toward those who love your name. Keep my steps steady according to your promise, and never let iniquity have dominion over me. Redeem me from human oppression, that I may keep your precepts. Make your face shine upon your servant, and teach me your statutes. Hearing these words from the psalmist, we are reminded of God's graciousness, God's steadfast love for us all, and we can acknowledge as God's beloved children that we have been forgiven in Jesus Christ, for it is truly a gracious and loving gift that we have received. Thanks be to God. Amen. Join with me in our prayer for illumination. Enlightening God, open our minds and hearts by the presence of your Holy Spirit that the mystery of your heavenly realm is made evident here on earth. Amen. Our Old Testament reading this morning is from 1 Kings, reading from the third chapter, beginning at the fifth verse and reading through the twelfth. I invite you to listen this morning for the word of the Lord. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night, and God said, Ask what I should give you. And Solomon said, You have shown great and steadfast love to your servant, my father David, because he walked before you in faithfulness, in righteousness, and in uprightness of heart toward you. And you have kept for him this great and steadfast love, and have given him a son to sit on his throne today. And now, O Lord my God, you have made your servant king in place of my father David. Although I am only a little child, I do not know how to, come, to go out or come in. And your servant is in the midst of the people whom you have chosen, a great people, so numerous they cannot be numbered or counted. Give your servant, therefore, an understanding mind to govern your people, able to discern between good and evil. For who can govern this, your great people? It pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this. God said to him, because you have asked this and have not asked for yourself long life or riches or for the life of your enemies, but have asked for yourself understanding to discern what is right, I now do according to your word. Indeed, I give you a wise and discerning mind. No one like you has been before you, and no one like you shall arise after you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We had scheduled and planned for special music, but uh, we discovered uh, a bit too late that our musicians for this morning were out of town. So we will continue in our service with the reading from the New Testament lesson, reading from the Gospel of Matthew. Jesus put before them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed that someone took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of all the seeds, but when it has grown, it is the greatest of shrubs and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast 
that a woman took and mixed in with three measures of flour until all of it was, was leavened. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field which someone found and hid. Then in his joy he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. On finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and caught fish of every kind. But when it was full, they drew it ashore, sat down, and put the good into baskets, but threw out the bad. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the furnace of fire, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Have you understood all this? They answered, Yes. And he said to them, Therefore, every scribe, who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven is like the master of a household who brings out his treasure, what is new and what is old. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So if someone were to offer you the gift of anything, anything you wanted, what might it be? Have you ever played that game with one another or, or within your own head of what if I won the lottery or what if some long lost unknown great uncle or aunt died and left me a gazillion dollars? Uh, what, what, I, what would I do with those things? But if someone came up and offered you anything that you wanted, what would it be? Would it be wealth? or, you know, not, not necessarily an overabundance of wealth, but just enough to make me very comfortable for the rest of my, and maybe my children could be maybe comfortable for the rest of my, well, also maybe the grandchildren as well. Or might it be that you would ask for health, that I want to have good, perfect health for all of my days, or maybe it is that you want to have a long life. Please, dear Lord, let me live to be older than Methuselah. You know how old Methuselah was when he died, according to the Bible? 965 years. That's a long time, folks. Would you ask for something maybe less selfish, less focused on yourself, maybe a cure? a cure for cancer, the common cold, or this thing that has ravaged our world right now? Or would you think in terms of asking for something like peace throughout the world, for the end of warfare between those nations where hostilities exist, between neighborhoods and households where we are seeing an explosion of violence, particularly gun violence, in, in our larger cities across America? Or is there something else that you might ask for? It was a little, I don't know, setting you up in terms of asking that question after just having read the passage from 1 Kings, because Solomon asks for probably the very best possible gift that anyone might ask, might, might want, the gift of wisdom. In fact, wisdom is highly valued. It is highly treasured throughout Scripture, and particularly in the Hebrew Scripture. There are, set, there are three books that are oftentimes identified with the um, uh, idea of wisdom. The book of Proverbs, the book of Job, and the book of Ecclesiastes. Those are, the, they're called by biblical scholars, the wisdom literature as well. So the book of Proverbs begins like this. The Proverbs of Solomon, son of, of David, king of Israel, for learning about wisdom and instruction, for understanding words of insight, for gaining instruction in wise dealing, righteousness, justice, and equity. Let the wise also hear and gain in learning. As I said, 
This book, Proverbs, Job, and Ecclesiastes, are identified as wisdom literature, and it's in the verses of each of those books that we gain a more comprehensive view, an understanding of what wisdom is, is all about. And it's within those books that the word wisdom, or the Hebrew word chokmah, is oftentimes used. As I shared at the beginning from, or as I shared from the opening verses of Proverbs, they are attributed to King Solomon, and that attribution it comes from what we read from the story, from the, the book of First Kings as well. Solomon was in fact known for his wisdom, and the narrative that we read from this third chapter tells how that wisdom came about. There is a very important theological lesson in this story that we need to attend to, but there are also a couple of other things in this story that we probably should get out of the way before we turn to the, the theology of this event. The first is that this particular story, what we read from 1 Kings chapter 3, was likely constructed and was originally told and written as propaganda. A ruler, anyone who is going to rule over people, needs to create uh, the image of being a ruler, needs to create the, the idea or the impression that they are a strong leader. And so in order to establish his legit legitimacy as the king, a story like this one is truly important. The appearance of a deity confirms the, the favored position of the king, in Solomon's case, the royal dream is both confirming God's election and implies that Solomon, who is the son of David, is supposed to be the ruler of all Israel, both the northern and the southern kingdoms. Recall that David had managed during his time as ruler to unite the northern and southern kingdoms into a single unit. And in order to maintain or sustain that, Solomon needed to, uh, to event or to, to promote or to let his subjects know that indeed God had chosen him to be the ruler over both. So he tells this particular story in order to establish his legitimacy. But there's a second idea about this that, that we need to get out of the way as well. It's unfortunate that in, this, in, in the setting for today, the lectionary, which I tend to preach from, is one that limits this particular event to, or, or, or the reading for today, to this one event. And it's a very narrow slice of the story of Solomon. Those who are not familiar with Solomon might walk away with a very incomplete, a very inaccurate understanding of him. You need to read further into the book of 1 Kings. You need, you need to glean a lot more information about Solomon because he was not as, as much of a goody two-shoes as it seems in the verses we read this morning. And then there's a third possible misconception and that is the risk, we run the risk of reading this particular passage or this particular story and confusing the role of God with, well, that of a magic genie, a character who, who appears and suddenly grants wishes like you might read in a grim fairy tale. Upon a closer reading of this story, there is that theological thread that we cannot ignore that we need to understand and need to appreciate. It's a thread that talks about the nature of God. If you'll note in this, at the beginning of that particular story, that it's not Solomon who pleads to God, it is that God comes to, Abr to, God comes to Solomon. God chooses in this story to reveal God's self to this ruler and gives an open invitation, ask what I should give you. And Solomon's response is exemplary. It acknowledges God's grace. It recognizes that he is undeserving of God's favor. Note in that particular story, when he talks about being a young boy, he, phys he, he chronologically was likely not a young boy. He was probably a grown man. 
but to admit or to include in the propaganda the, the phrasing, I'm young, means I'm, I'm inexperienced and throwing yourself kind of on the, the mercy of the deity. Solomon recognizes that he is truly undeserving of God's favor. And then he wisely asks that he might be allowed to rule his people justly. In the wisdom tradition, it makes practical sense to seek wisdom first, for then all other benefits will flow. And we go back to the book of Proverbs in order to, to understand that. Happy are those who find wisdom and those who get understanding, for her income is better than silver. Her revenue is better than gold. She is more precious than jewels, and nothing you desire can compare with her. Long life is in her right hand. In her left hand are riches and honor. Her ways are ways of pleasantness, and all her paths are peace. That, those are attributed to Solomon, to this wise king, this, this ruler, who had asked for a discerning mind. Solomon's story as I say, only looking at these verses is very incomplete. The, the section that follows in chapter 3 is a story that I recall from my childhood uh, Sunday school classes, and it's the story of the two women and the one baby. Maybe you, you re remember hearing the story where two women who each have had a baby, one baby is dead and one baby is still alive and the two women come before the king and argue that the baby that is still alive is theirs, and the dead baby is the other woman's baby. I don't know why they taught this to me in, as a child in Sunday school, because you know what the wisdom of Solomon says to do? Take a sword and cut it in half. Cut the live baby in half. Upon which the woman whose, whose baby the live baby was said, Oh, no, 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 give it to the other woman. Whereas the woman whose baby had died, I guess, felt she had nothing else to lose. That's how wise Solomon is portrayed. Richard Clifford, professor emeritus of Boston College through, uh, at their School of Theology, writes that wisdom is not one of those terms that we can satisfactorily capture in just a single brief definition. And he, he notes that there are probably four aspects to the concept of wisdom. The first is that it's practical. It's knowledge about how the world works so that one might master and enjoy life fully. Now, it's far more than just knowing. It's about knowing and doing, acting or doing. The second is that it has limits. Knowledge or wisdom is aware of finitude, of where we are, where the person might be at that particular place and time. It's based on what we observe, what we understand our world and our place in it to be. Third, it's, a ta it's generally a human task, and it's a divine gift acquired through experience and obedience. And most significantly, it comes from a theological understanding given by God. And then the fourth aspect to wisdom is that, especially when we look in Scripture, it becomes for us an object of constant reflection. The book of Proverbs is written that we might reflect on our life together or our individual lives so that we might attain wisdom as we study, as we, as we hear the wisdom from others. Wisdom is oftentimes described as the fear of the Lord. We hear that often spoken in, jo in the book of Job. It's personified as a beautiful woman who offers to share with her friends the life that she shares with God. Again, we read that in, in Proverbs. We read that also in Ecclesiastes. We need to note 
and this is, this is this where we're getting to the real theology of this story, is that wisdom is a gift given by a loving and gracious God. The wisdom that Solomon possessed was widely known, it was celebrated, but neither his wisdom nor any of the other things he attained were solely due to his righteousness alone. He did not learn to be wise, he did not possess wisdom as this innate birthright. He was given wisdom upon his response to God's invitation. The downside to, as I say, to just reading these verses designated for the day is that it presents for us this ideal Solomon, a king who, who should have been and not necessarily is the one we discover if we read the rest of his story. Such is the nature of God throughout Scripture. God responds to imperfect love, to, it, to the sincere, if inadequate, response of humans with undeserved blessings. Note that what Solomon is promised in addition to wisdom are all those other things, wisdom, long life. God summons humanity again and again through wisdom's voice to love and to obey. When we read the, the gospel lesson from Matthew, it's almost exclusively, or particularly chapter 13, is exclusively about Jesus' ministry in parables. And this morning, it was a rapid-fire succession of parables that Jesus tells. Those parables are told to impart wisdom, to instruct by providing a glimpse of, as all those that we read today, of the kingdom of God. They offer us this gift of wisdom in ways that are far more deeper than we might consider if we just look at them and read them on the, from the surface. Those who originally heard those stories likely found themselves so bewildered, so confused, since Jesus is undermining, he is not bolstering, but in some ways the illustrations he's using in these parables undermines the preconceived ideas of how God would work to bring in, well, God's kingdom. Those whose lives were lived under Roman aggression, those who found themselves under the oppression of an occupying force, expected a kingdom that would arrive in an earthly and political sense. Some of them wished that it would be Caesar who would be overthrown by a king of their own liking, a king that they might choose if they were asked, what would you like? And surprisingly, or maybe not so surprisingly, we discover that the king that we would identify as the one of our own choosing, surprisingly the crown size is the same as our hat size. But to use the imagery of a mustard seed, which is a small shrub, it says it grows into a large tree, but in reality, a mustard seed only grows to be a shrub or yeast, which is, at its very core, a contaminant. It is, a, it is something that will disturb the flower and turn it, change its content completely. To use those as symbols of the kingdom of God was as disturbing and shocking as acknowledging that, well, God's anointed king for this coming kingdom would be represented by a humble man who did not have a palace in which to live and whose life would be cut short by the pain and agony of a cross. In fact, the presence of God's kingdom in our own world is likely to scandalize even our ideas of where and how God's kingdom is supposed to be present. We've created a short-sighted tendency to picture us, to picture the church as the mustard seed, the church as the yeast, the church universal, the church local as the objects in these parables. But the parables are about the kingdom. They are not about the church. For we are imperfect. We must admit 
that sin has distorted our relationship with God and with one another. The wisdom we desire is too often selfish and in some cases too punitive. The God who loved Solomon is the same God who loves each of us, who desires a right relationship with each of us, who offers each of us the gift, the true gift of wisdom, and from whom blessings flow. We won't sing it, but it's a part of our liturgy when we present our offerings. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. And those blessings are undeserved, yet graciously given. Happy are those who find wisdom and those who get understanding. Thanks be to God. Amen. As we gather for a time of prayer, I would ask that you keep in, in your prayers the family of one of the young men who is part of the Caught Up program. You may have uh, heard last week of the shooting of young men on the, here on the east side in a drive-by shooting, and unfortunately one of the individuals in that car who is gravely, um, gravely injured was a participant in the, the caught up ministry. And so we have been keeping him in our prayers throughout this week. I would ask that you also provide or keep, keep he and your, his family along with those who participate in caught up in your prayers. Let us join together in a time of prayer. Holy God, you have blessed humanity with understanding and the ability to choose the good. Give to your people a vision of your world made whole, the wisdom to pursue it, 
and the will to accomplish it. You have given your world the gift of Jesus to transform our suffering into healing and hope. Be with all who suffer hardship, distress, or need, and help us to honor you by serving together as we grow in the mercy and compassion of Christ. You blessed us with the gift of creation and call us to uphold its purpose of declaring your holy splendor. Join us with the Spirit's movement in caring for your world as we await our redemption from glory into glory. We give thanks for the gift of hope that never ends and that we are more than victors through the one who loved us. We place before you the times when we felt all alone, the injustices that have kept others out, the enmity with strangers and neighbors alike from whom we keep our distance. We pray for the sick and for those who care for them. We pray for the dying and those who grieve because of death. We pray for persons who long for closer contact at a time when we must maintain our distance. We pray for those who are anxious, even as we remember and acknowledge all of the individual and society and anxiety of this time. We give you thanks that nothing can separate us from you. Hear us in the silence of this moment as we offer to you our individual petitions. To you, O God, we give thanks for all the blessings we have received. To you, we are truly grateful for your steadfast love and mercy for us. And so we ask that you hear us as we join our voices together, praying the prayer that our Lord has taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I invite you to listen to our song, Jesus, Priceless Treasure.
On social media, there is a, a, a meme or there's a post that oftentimes shows up on Thursdays. It usually begins with the letters TBT, and it stands for Throwback Thursday. And it's oftentimes a photo or a memory of something from the past. Those who have gathered here in the sanctuary um, who have a, a long history with this congregation are probably thinking this is one of those TBS uh, as we've gathered here. It's currently 83 degrees in the, in the sanctuary proper, according to the thermometer that is here in front of me. Um, it is a reminder of those Sundays that we gathered in this time and place pre-air conditioning um, as, as we gather for, for worship. We gather, though, blessed because God has brought us into this place for worship once again. Remember that it is by the power of the Holy Spirit that God has given you the gift of discernment to resist evil, to choose what is good, to guide your feet in the way of peace. So may, that, may the God of peace, creation, liberation, and illumination bless you as you go on this journey. And as you go from this place today, go remembering it is in the goodness of God you were born. It is by the grace of God in Jesus Christ that you have been redeemed. It's by the power of God through the Holy Spirit that you are sustained today, tomorrow, and forevermore. Alleluia. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord.